everybody welcome back if you were here for the last one. If not, welcome. This is a single beam uh, data collection. <coughs> How many people in here have done data collection with high-pack single beam? And has anybody never done it at all? All right. So the survey windows. So this is once you're in the high pack shell and you open up the survey program, all this is from that perspective, from being in, inside that survey program. So the survey program is made up of several different windows. Uh, the main window is the control panel for the high pack survey has access to all the setting dialogues, data displays, driver windows um, from the menus, and primary buttons uh, for quick access to start and stop logging, which is on the left. And this scroll, scroll here, if you were not logging, the scroll will be in green, you press it to start, and then a red scroll will pop up, and then again, if you want to stop, you press the red scroll and go back to green. You can select uh, active plan lines that you're surveying. You can mark targets and set tide corrections and enable real-time data overlays like matrix coverages and side scan mosaic. So then the map window um, contains a plan view of your survey area. The area map displays background files active in the shell so when you're in the shell and you, you bring up um, some map imagery and then if you make plan lines or if you make a survey grid or a matrix you load all that stuff into the high pack shell and you can toggle it turn it on and off and then when you go into the survey program this is where all, all those files are displayed. So any uh, background any background file, um, grids, plan lines, targets, channels, matrix files, those are all displayed in the map. There's a left-right indicator, which if you have, if you create survey lines, the left-right indicator is going to tell you your distance from being on that line. So it, it, it helps you helps you stay straight and stay on your lines. It only appears if you have plan lines loaded in. That's what it's indicating you are left or right from, a plan line. Um, they show the position of the main vessel relative to that plan survey line. Um, in this example, um, Helms was following the plan line closely and Looks like he's less than a foot off, off the line. So the data display windows show textual information about the survey or dredge project. So in the data display, you can configure it however you want. On the left-hand side of the data display configuration window, it pops up. These are all the available displays that you can have. There's there's a ton of them. Some of them, you know, some of them are more for dredging only, some are for survey. But you go through there to customize this data display to show to show whatever you want. Your heading, depth, you can see you know, the examples that are up there. You can create spaces like under the corrected depth and uh, easting. Um, you can put them in any line in any order that you want. So it's, pr it's pretty user friendly and it's pretty easy to do. You can add multiple data displays also if you have, if you want to see data from different devices on a different window, you can have multiple data displays. And you can configure the size of them and the shape of them. <coughs> it's really customizable. Uh, the profile window shows a cross section view of the entire plan survey line. So if the plan line contains 
template points or separate channel plan is loaded, the, the information will be overlaid on the depth graph. With, when a new plan line becomes active, the profile will update accordingly. So if you have a bunch of plan lines and you have a matrix that you're working with, when you finish a line, you get to the end of it and you turn around and you start on a new line, it's going to reset your profile window for that next line that you're survey line that you're, that you're running. <coughs> so the comment window allows the operator to store uh, text notes uh, in the project log. So it can be comments that you want to enter in while you're surveying. And then when uh, you're going through the editing process, you can see those comments to is something you notice, an anomaly or something you want to, um, anything you want to record or, or, or note to that particular time in the survey, and it'll come back when you're, if you're going through the editing process, you can see the notes that you've made. Alarm conditions are reported on the bottom of the main window. An alarm sound will repeat until the escape key is pressed, and the alarm will be displayed until the condition is rectified. There's all kind of different alarms you can set, you can have your set an alarm if any any of your hardware or anything goes out of preset parameters. So if you if a, if a, you can set a certain depth and if you get out of that depth range, maybe it's uh, you know for for safety for your for your sonar you want to hit the bottom. Uh, so you get alarms. You can set alarms uh, to notify you when that happens. There's a GPS quality window. It's a GPS graph enabling the operator to monitor the quality of the GPS solution. Device time series windows. Um, just a series of standard data types of uh, interest to the operator. Graph the values reported to the survey from device drivers. So when you look at device up with GPS, for example, it's sending messages in, and you can graph those, the data that's coming in, uh, so you can see it while you're surveying, including key, pitch, roll, tie, and depth. So survey can be configured with different di display schemes, uh, which alter how the program looks. You can create different color combinations to suit changing uh, weather, lighting, um, weather, lighting conditions, or the personal taste um, of the helmsman. You can use built-in defaults or customize your own with the scheme builder. So this is just going through um, different different schemes. Maybe some used during the day, brighter ones, and then some darker ones they've used at night. So the window manager manages all those different types of display windows that we just looked at. Um, manipulate the placement of the survey windows across um, available monitors. You can spread these out over different, different monitors if you're lucky enough to have a couple. Um, assign individual windows, different monitors, uh, tile or cascade them, or use the tool to recover a window lost somewhere out in space. So all these are independent windows. And Sometimes they'll just disappear, and so the Windows Manager, you can go back and the window list is going to show which windows you have displayed. You can save a favorite layout. Um, so if you have multiple operators and they like to see different configurations of the data display, you can save those in, in preferences so you don't have to go back and change it, customize it every time. So for Keyboard sh shortcuts. Um, so if we go back up to the very beginning, this start and stop logging on the left. It can be done with shortcuts for Control S. Um, oh, sorry, this is that's for start line and end line. So 
if you have multiple lines that you're running, you can start and stop uh, a line of data, so it's going to save um, that into a separate line, into a separate file, and then start a new one. So you can start without stopping collecting data. You can start a new line by starting a new one, so it'll, it'll end that line and save it, and then start a new one that it'll save. Control W will switch direction. Maybe you planned on running a line in a certain direction, and you are turning around and you want to go back and do it in the opposite direction. Control W will switch the direction that line is going to be ran. So when you're not logging, the next line would be an increment, decrement would be going back a line. So if you've got a series of parallel lines, you can say, I want to go forward one line to the starboard and one line back. Okay. Control I, Control V. Um, Check the status in the data display after you start each line to verify that you are logging. The last thing you want to do is get out there and think you've been logging for the last half a mile and, and you never started. So it shows in bright red status uh, if it's not logging. So just look at that. It's an easy way to save some time. Uh, after logging is ended, survey will update the selected plan line according to the line increment options in the navigation parameters dialog. So it'll move on to the next survey line that you're gonna run. And then control S and control E to start logging and end logging, which could also be done with the scroll green or red to start or stop. The surveyor can abort a line after it has been begun with control A. Generates an, an immediate end line action. The current data is saved, uh, but not included in the day's log file. The active planned line remains the same, and you can go back and survey it again. So uh, start line gates, that would be uh, a line gate specifies an area that when enter triggers a start or stop logging action. So you can have a series of lines that you create and then you have gates set. <coughs> if you're, you're surveying and you're heading north and that plan line ends, in this case it'd be 25 foot past it, it automatically stop logging and then if you turn around switch directions go south and if you go through that gate it'll begin logging for you. Okay, yep. Uh, do you change that in the survey or in the shell? You do that uh, in the yeah in navigation parameters in survey. So, that's a really bad picture, and I don't know who the jackass was put these slides back. <laughs> <laughs> you can't really see. There's a big red circle here, right? The line going through it. Did they come in and start recording this? Because I just said something bad. <laughs> Darn. <laughs> so you have a big red circle there. If this number is a positive number, it's a big red circle. How many people in here play video games? Anybody play video games? I like to play video games. It's like a big video game. Anyone know what the ectus symbol is in your survey? It's a circle with two little arms on it and a needle sticking out of the front of it. 
the way the start line gate works, to make it simple for people driving a boat, because we don't want to click a lot of buttons, we created this object that's a big circle in space, and if you drive your boat inside that circle, it starts logging. Okay? We can make that circle big or small. If you're in a 50-foot line spacing, don't make your circle 50 feet, because when you end the line, it's going to start logging the next one as you're trying to turn around. We do that a lot with the little USB things. People get smart and they make lines really close together because those little automatic boats can follow really tight lines. But then they forget to make their smart start line gate small enough that those things don't automatically start in the next line. Did you talk about negative start line gates? No. Anyone know what a negative start line gates? I'll give you my drink coupon. <laughs> Yes. Get my drink coupon. I'm not feeling well, so you get an extra drink. So the negative start line gate, because it's a big ass circle, right? So you're out here and you're trucking along in your boat, and you turn around and you start coming on, and I've got a 25 foot circle. So 25 feet before I get to the data I give a crap about, I'm going to start logging. So I've got an extra 25 feet of data that I don't really care about, right? Which can affect everything we're going to do as we process it. A negative start line gate creates a half moon. It creates a perpendicular line to my planned line. So if my planned line started right here, this is the data I care about. 25 foot start line gate, back here, I'm going to start logging. I don't want to start logging back here, because this data I don't care about. <coughs> so a negative one is not going to, it's going to create a line here and it's going to have a 25 foot radius that way. So I could be offline over here and still start logging, but only once I broke the plane of my survey data that I really care about. It's really nice, anyone, you know, we talked about side scan, you guys don't do side scan. If you're doing side scan mosaics and you create the main vessel as your tow fish, and you use a negative start line gate, the edge of your mosaic will always be a straight line. It looks really great with mosaicing side scan data. It creates very straight edges. It prevents you from collecting that lead-in data. Anyone do volumes? I'm supposed to give a volume lecture, and we're going to see if that possibly can happen. We'll see how I feel. But in volumes, cross-sections in volumes comes up, and it'll say descending DVLs. Anyone know what a descending DVL is? It's a number getting closer to zero. Out here, that's my zero point, so I've got a point here from the beginning of my line, I'm a negative distance, right? So I'm negative four, I'm negative three, I'm negative one, I'm negative two, or negative zero, I'm right here, I'm on my line. Those numbers, those negative, they get cut off before we calculate a volume. We don't care about those because they're before the end, beginning of our line, before the beginning of our template. So a negative start line gate is gonna give you that half moon and prevent having that data. Most of the time, who cares? It's just extra data, right? Anyone use a single meme editor for 64-bit yet? You can process a whole survey in 15 minutes. It's pretty easy and pretty quick to clean up data and, and do stuff in. So if I got a little bit of extra data, I mean, it's probably more than 15 minutes. I just don't really care. Clean up the data and I'm done. Um, but as you get into it, that negative start line gate's not gonna, it's gonna clean up your data only in cases where you don't want that extra information. I beat that to death, right? Now my voice hurts. I gotta sit down. <laughs> Good job, Josh. So negative start line gate. Negative twenty five. If it's negative one, what he's asking about negative one, it's not one foot inside the channel, it's a one foot radius. How good's your boat driver? <laughs> <laughs> right. How many people think they can hit within one foot of a spot in the world with their boat that they need to start logging? You would have to be within one foot of your planned line's beginning point to automatically start. I only me probably met one person in the world that could do it, and I don't, you don't remember his name. But I would put it about a negative ten in most cases. You know, if you're plus or minus ten feet, most people can hit that. Stuff. Back to Josh. All right, so naming schemes. Uh, IPAM provides several naming convention options uh, for the data files. There's 
standard high pass file names, long file names, CHS, Julian Day as extension. So this is all the, the name of your file. Um, maybe you want to be able to reference them by date. Um, so you know, there's different reasons why you want to name them differently, and there's different options to be able to do it. Tracking the vessel. Each area map uh, maintains independent uh, vessel tracking configuration. Um, in center, as, as the vessel approaches the edge uh, of the window, it jumps back to the center. Um, looking ahead, uh, as the vessel moves away from the edge of the window, it jumps back to the edge. <coughs> vessel and target automatically zooms in as the vessel approaches the active target. No tracking, um, the screen bounding box remains fixed, so the screen doesn't fix based on the tracking of the boat. And all vessels keeps all mobiles visible in the area map. So this is, in, in your map when you're surveying, this is how the map reacts to or doesn't react to the mobiles that are set up with your survey. So this is just showing uh, under the settings, orienta uh, orientation and tracking. You want to go from um, the center. So again, that's as the vessel approaches the edge of the window, it jumps back to the center, or the window jumps to center the boat. 10%, uh, in this case, uh, in center frame percentage. This is where you would select how you want to track or not track. So each area map maintains independent orientation settings. Use it to find, use the fixed uh, rotation relative to north. Line up, the map will rotate to keep the active plane line oriented vertically on the screen. Uh, vessel up, the map will rotate to keep the vessel head, uh, heading pointing vertically up the screen when the change in heading exceeds the specified threshold. I know I have, you know, my preferred way of, of, of doing this. Whoever you have as a boat driver is probably who's going to be the deciding factor on how your uh, map orientation goes. I like to have the vessel up. I want to look, at, you know, look at the vessel as it's, as it's moving, but some people don't, so this is just all personal preferences and this in particular is a lot, a lot of times going to be the decision of the, uh, the driver. So setting, tracking orientation, this is under the vessel tracking, that was the map orientation and um, that's where you set up uh, those options. So survey can have multiple tracking points on each mobile. The X, Y, Z of each tracking point is displayed on the map. And you can select the main tracking point to be used at any time from the tracking points window. Survey can also log uh, statistics on each tracking point to get the average position and standard deviation during uh, moves. All right, key point about this. Earlier we talked about mobiles and things we cared about, right? So you care about mobiles, you care about the towfish, you care about the cutter head, and knowing we log a whole bunch of information about a mobile. <coughs> Tracking points are different. Rig moves, things along rig moves, um, barges. I know, Eric, there's a bunch of projects you guys have done where this has come into play where we've been able to track things and do stuff with it. You can actually track points on the dredge that you want to, or vessel or barge, for single beam surveyors it's not that important, but you can track multiple things and um, get references to them and get measurements off of them without having to go through the process of setting up mobiles. So if you have a cleat, um, I recently was down in Groton, Connecticut working on a barge and they're doing some blasting and we used the forward starboard cleat as a tracking point because they had to put this frame in a certain spot so they could blast rock. 
and we wanted that. We didn't want to offset everything because we had a very tightly controlled GPS solution, but we wanted to know where that cleat was all the time. And it helped us align our, our <coughs> grid with what we wanted to do. We moved that cleat to different things we wanted to do. Um, so it's nice to be able to turn these on and off and look at the different information from them. They're really quick offsets to where things are on board. Naturally, there's a Diet Coke machine on board because I was working, so you know, we're going to have our drinks. So, anchor handling, um, boat anchor manager window is accessed from the vessel's window. From this window, you can drop and raise anchors and transfer them to uh, other mobile support vessels. You can also place floats on anchor wires or Radius circles about dropped anchors. This is more to pull the dredging. Multiple position sensors per mobile. So, HIPAC survey allows to assign multiple positioning sensors to a single mobile. Uh, the boat multi position window is used to select one or more sensors to determine the final vessel position. If multiple sensors are selected, an average position is calculated. So the green dots show the three GPS positions, and the red dot shows their average in the center of the red box. If your boat has a reference point, whichever one of those you choose or the average is where the reference point is going to be projected in high tech. So the position you use is going to be based on so the position you use here that goes out to the survey program and gets recorded, which in this case is the red dot, is the position that you're actually going to be sending out. That's the one that you're going to be recording and the one you think that position is. So all of your GPSs should reference the same point on board. Does that make sense? Jump from one to the other and your boat's going to move all over the place, right? So they all want to have that starboard forward cleat as a reference point. And whichever one you choose, it's going to offset back to that starboard forward cleat. This was designed so that if you're going under a bridge, we did some rig moves with the big oil rigs. And they wanted to move them under, and they had to go under bridges or whatever. I don't know why you would move one of the big ass things under a bridge, but they were. They wanted to be able to jump from one to the other. As they lost GPS on forward GPS, they wanted to jump to the aft GPS until the forward one was clear of the bridge and they could jump back to it without the barge losing its overall track of position. So that's what this comes from. I'm going to step out a minute. Okay. So remote viewing. Um, you can observe and interact with HIPAC survey using remote view tools. View vessel position, manual, manually <coughs> control, um, stopping and starting logging. Use any web enabled device, smartphone, tablet, computers. Uh, it's controlled access and secured for you. So you can you can control the survey parts of the survey program from an office while somebody's on a boat running the boat. And you can monitor them. Um, is there an app for that? I'll have to find out. I haven't used it at all. Um, I don't know if it's an app or not. So navigation parameters, um, navigation parameters uh, dialogue and survey uh, provides options to automate plan um, line navigation, customize data logging, configure backups, depth alarms, um, set event markers. And so it's under options of the survey window, navigation parameters. So set your start line gate, Several things we were talking about. This is where you would set those parameters. So yeah, that's just back to. I think it's the same image from before. That start line gate, 25 um, foot radius from the start of the line, which would start and or stop logging. Cross, uh, cross track error alarm. Um, uh, HIPAC will generate an XTE alarm if the tracking point moves outside of the limit specified in navigation parameters. 
So it's relative to the active plan line that you're on. And setting limit to zero disables the alarm. Uh, event marks. So again, still in navigation parameters. Next event is the, the next event number to use. Event interval, the time in seconds or distance along <coughs> line of grid uh, units between events. Event increment number uh, added to the prior event number to generate the next number. Um, you can do it manually, make your own marks start and end uh, line and manually uh, control end to make event marks and start and line. Time, make event marks and start or end of line uh, in seconds or <coughs> in distance. Leg switch. How many people have a straight line that starts here and goes there? That's it. That's all you ever do. Straight <coughs> lines. Sometimes you have a line where you want to survey. It starts here, it goes there, and it turns left. Right? Anyone golf? I go out on golf courses. I'm not really a good golfer, but I go on golf courses. Sometimes there's a dog leg left, right? Sometimes you have surveys where you're surveying in a channel, and your line goes straight up the channel, and it makes a left, and it makes a left. Those are multi-segmented lines. This comes into play on a multi-segmented line. If you're doing from here to there, turn around and go from there to there, none of that matters. Because there's no seconds, right? I'm starting logging, I am logging. I don't have a turn. If you have a turn, line direction mode, when you hit that end of the line, you turn to the next line, it decides whether or not you're going up the line or you're gonna come back, right? So if you have origin point, and anyone you parallel offsets? Do you guys understand parallel offsets? We talked about that in the PyPack 101 session over there somewhere, one of the other ones. I made a line right here, and I said every 10 feet, I want a parallel line. The start of every line is right here. And the next one is right here, going that way. And the next one is right here, going that way. However, if I want closest point, when I get to the end of line one, it doesn't want me to drive all the way back here and then go line two the same direction. It swaps the line direction and let me run back up here, right? So I can go counter directions and just efficiently do my survey. But if I do origin point, it's going to say run line one and then start back here at the beginning of line two at the origin point, which is my end, not your end. You don't want to do that. That takes forever, right? Uh, if you're in a current, or also if you're going into shallows. <coughs> I know a lot of guys that survey into the shallow, and they always want to survey into the shallow, so they make their line start in the center of channel. Because then you're headed towards the danger. Make sense? <coughs> so, alternate points does the same thing as close points in most cases, but it might not. Anyone use AutoCAD? How many people in here use AutoCAD? Did I get you sick? You just coughed. I hope I didn't get you sick. Okay. I've been trying to stay away from people with my illnesses. How many people use AutoCAD? I asked that question, right? How many people export your lines from AutoCAD and import them into iPad? If you do that, anyone use the next line feature in AutoCAD to make parallel lines? Have ever import them into iPad and realize that line one and line two aren't always side by side? AutoCAD sometimes will just like throw your lines in a random order. 
So line one was here and I wanted offset lines for 10 lines. This might be the next line that they output in the file. And when we import them, it's line one and line two and line three and line four and line five. They're just random. I've had it happen to me. And then all of a sudden you have to reorient all your lines. Alternate points would be screwed up if that ever happened. All right, any questions about automatic lake switch? <coughs> we'll talk, go back one. We'll talk about the line information. Next line, line increment. Next line is what line am I going to survey next time? Line increment says one. So, has anyone ever done a survey where you skip a line? There are revetment surveys in Louisiana. Anybody in here from Louisiana? Army Corps revetment surveys. They used to be every third line single beam. You did line one, you did line four, you did line seven, whatever it was. It was every third line single beam. Now they do a multi beam because they're just quick and easy. So we would put in there a line increment three. I survey line one, the very next line I get is four. And it skips over those two because every other year they would move down a line and because there were so many lines they had to run, they couldn't possibly run them all. That's what that's for. Line increment lets me skip lines. If I'm, if I'm out there on a day and I'm going to run every other line or whatever, for whatever other reason, I don't know, but I'm only going to run some of my lines this week, right? That would be what line increment is. Anyone do check surveys for dredges? Check surveys for dredges, you might skip a couple lines because you're just doing a check. You're not doing every line along the dredge. I would do every line along the dredge. Maybe you don't. Line increment. Currents. A lot of times you're going to go line one, line two, line three, line four. Something could occur where you want to go line four, line three, line two, line one. You want to work backwards. Maybe the tide's shifting or something else is going on. If you put a negative line increment, it'll be line two, line one, negative, right? You'll count down instead of counting up. So if I put in a negative two for line increment, I'm going to go from four to negative two. I'm going to skip a line, right? Because I had to bigger jump. Everyone understand that? Any questions? All right, let's go. Line direction modes. Hit the next one. Closest point. That makes sense. It's kind of what I was talking about. All the lines were created on the other end. And they come this way. Hit the next one. That's the one where you're in a current. It's kind of self-explanatory. It's a lot of slides to talk about five minutes ago. Yep, we discussed it. Keep going. Other options. Hit the button. Log backup time, matrix backup time. Anyone <coughs> these are? Anyone ever go out there and not survey with a line? Okay. Anyone ever go out there and survey really long lines? Anyone ever go out there and have a crash in the middle of a very long line? You lost all of your data. You wanted to strangle tech support because you lost all of your data. I'm going to run. Josh is slower than me because I'm closer to the door. <laughs> Just saying. Log backup time. If you're out there surveying for a long period of time, and this is great with multi-beam jobs where you're not surveying with lines all the time, or if you're out there just doing, running around with your boat, doing a general check survey of an area, every X number of minutes, it stops logging, and it starts a new file without you touching the computer. Somebody used a word today, it was auto magic. It's auto magic. It just stops logging and starts up. It's like you press that start logging button, but you did. Auto magic. So, matrix backup time. Anyone in here use matrixes? Okay, so that's going to tell your software if you use a matrix, it's a color filled gridded square. I always like to point up at the ceiling, and you see all the squares in the ceiling? Imagine that grid is on your water. And each one of these squares, we're going to color in based on the depth. That's what a matrix does for you. But in a single beam, you're going to get a line of color and then a line of color. It's not going to fill in in between. But when you're doing that, if you're using the matrix and you've been out on a job, eight hours, and it crashes, now you've lost your matrix. But if you use matrix backup time, it's actually going to back up your matrix. And we came up with this really smart way of doing it. It makes a backup every 15 minutes or whatever it is for one day. It'll only hold one day's worth of matrix data. 
It won't fill your hard drive up with a million files. It only holds the last day. Is that new or has it always been like that or is that just for survey? Because I feel like Dredge Pack, it'll just keep on making it. It's, well, if you change the name of the matrix, it'll keep making them. Like if you change your matrix every so often, it'll back up one day of the new matrix. <laughs> Starting in about 2016 or 17, we came up with it. What it does, and I'll explain this because you brought up, in Dredge Pack, we use matrices all the time, which is what was running on my laptop. You're dredging through the matrix and everything. Say you start at 7.11 in the morning. You have a 15 minute backup. So at 7.26, it's gonna make a 0.7.15 file. At 7 whatever it is, 7.47 or 7.44, it's gonna make the 7.30 file. Tomorrow you start at 7 o'clock, 7.15, it's gonna erase the 7.15 file and make a new one. It uses the cardinal times, if you use 15 minutes, it uses whatever your interval is, and it, it lops off an average lops off the last digit and then makes the average time so that you always overwrite the same file tomorrow that you overwrote today. And that way you can always bring them back. And they're binary files, they don't take up a lot of space unless you're on a huge dredging project. Anyone have questions about any of that? Yes, sir? Is there any other options uh, to like, move, like file size? There's not, but we've discussed it. One of the things we were supposed to talk about in the session earlier today was de-owling of IPAC and one of the things we're doing within our survey program. We're changing our survey program's base functions and as soon as we finish that, a lot of those types of features are gonna be able to be added. We're, we're stabilizing, I, anyone hear that in the, the, this morning? In the opening we talked about, we spent a year going through and just kind of making sure we reduce the amount of things that escape the company is, is not functional. And one of them is getting rid of some of the technical debt that we've got. The company's been around for over 30 years. The software's been around doing this stuff for a long time. We're trying to, you know, how you build on things. Eventually, you get to the point you need a new foundation. And we're rebuilding the foundation of our survey program to allow us to do things like you're asking, based on size or based on time, or more rapidly respond to some of the requests that are. It's going to be kind of cool. Any other questions? Depth alarms. All this is gonna do is give you a little, anyone ever seen the alarms in survey? Anyone ever seen the alarm little red box that block blinks and says XTE on it? Means you're too far from your survey line. You're not within a foot of your start line gate. It gives you that line error. That's what the, these depth alarms are gonna show up in that same spot. You're too shallow. How many people drive the boat? A few of you guys drive the boat? Anyone ever run to the ground? <laughs> you drive a boat, you probably run it to ground. That's what I'm saying. I was out teaching the tech support team. I had a side scan on my boat, my personal boat, teaching them how do you do side scan. Because we do actually try to be able to do what you do so we can help you better. I had a side scan hanging off the side of my boat, going about eight miles an hour, eight knots, and uh, ran into a weir that was underwater that I didn't see. And Ripped the side scan, didn't hit the boat, hit the side scan, flipped it up in the air, almost dropped the GPS in the water, knocked all the hardware off, pulled cables. It was awesome. <laughs> it was really great when you're the instructor teaching all the smart guys that work with me and say, oh, guys, yeah, I just crashed. <laughs> I called my boss and said, I ripped the side scan off. It's fun. So the depth alarms, if you have a minimum depth alarm, that probably would have told me that I'd be in the dumbass. More options. Man, we got too many options in this software. Maybe I'll start getting rid of them. Let's go. Uh, reset events on startup, your event number is going to continue in your project. Anyone use events? You know what events are? Who's here from New Orleans? New Orleans, don't use them anymore. The future. I'm going to pick on New Orleans for a second. I was part of the integration team that brought New Orleans into the HiPAC fold. Years, years, years ago, long time ago. And we had to do events every 50 feet down the line, and they had to be at 50 feet. We recently modified the software about four or five years ago so that it would guarantee, no matter where you started logging, it, events used to be based on start of logging, right? So you started logging, remember that start line gate 25 feet? Let's say I started at 13 feet, 
my next event would be 50 feet down line, so I'm at 37 feet, not 50 feet. And then when I started the next one, I started at zero, I'm at 50 feet, so my events would look like this on the map. They'd be all screwed up. We modified it so if you have an event based on distance, it starts at zero. So if you start at zero, and I start logging at 13 feet, I'm going to get an event at 13 feet. But I'm also going to get an event at zero, and at 50, and at 100, so you're evenly spaced events down the line. And that was all put in for New Orleans so that they could line the events up because of the amount of data you guys do. And that's just what we were trying to, to match something that they needed. Reset events on startup is really important because if you survey the same project day after day after day, you're going to have event one at the beginning of your survey. When you stop logging and go to lunch and you come back out and start survey again, now you're going to have event 184 because that's the next event. But if you check the box to reset your events, you're going to have event one. Event one is going to start every time you start survey. It's going to start off with a one event. Make sense? You check the box and you're surveying a couple times during the day and starting to stop the software. You could be confused of which one's the right event. Even intervals is the stuff that I was talking about for these guys. Connect events, they'll actually connect segments on the map. So you'll have an event here, you'll have an event here, and it'll draw a line between the two events. I don't know why the hell you want to do that, but somebody must have asked for it because we did it. Anyone in here understand grid convergence? Do you know what grid convergence is? I just learned about this after 22 years of being at HIPEC. Learned about it about two years ago. The closer you are to the beginning of your grid, the beginning of your, of your geo or your, your pre-defined geodesy grid, north is north, right? The further away you are from the zero, zero point, the more grid divergence you have. And grid divergence is, when you take a round earth and make it flat, north isn't north. So you might be off a couple degrees to get back to north. So zero, you get over to like 100,000 X and start going north, well north isn't straight up X. It might be off a little bit, and it's called grid convergence. And that's what we're talking about here. So if your input to your heading is geodetic, and you check this box, it will try to apply grid convergence for your particular survey grid. And it will adjust your heading by however many degrees it needs to to be north on the grid is north on the map. Make sense? It actually comes into play a lot with dredgers, more than I thought it would. When you start putting a dredge in New Jersey, far away from its zero point, and the guy starts swinging the dredge, your cutter head's in the wrong spot because of grid convergence. Kind of bit us in the ass on a job. So it's a good excuse for an operator when he's on the job. <laughs> now that I've told you that, <laughs> <laughs> and the operator screws up, oh man, it was great convergence. <laughs> Have you ever used hear the word like buzzwords? What you should take back from our conference is at least one buzzword that your boss doesn't know. It's one get out of jail free card. Man, when I was at the high pack conference, I bet you it was great convergence. <laughs> They were talking about that a lot. That doesn't apply to you. Your boss won't accept it. <laughs> OK. Vessels and their functions, we already talked about this stuff, right? But when you go to vessel configuration, this is a really big display that lets you control how your vessels are displayed, <coughs> what you're going to look at on the map. So under the vessels dialog, each boat, each vessel will show up here. If you have multiple maps, do you know you can have four maps in HIPAC? How many people have multiple monitors on their survey boat? You can have more than one map. So if you have a monitor for the helm, you have a monitor for the survey station, you can put a map on each one of them. You just go under Window, New, Window, Maps, drag it over there, they can look at different things, different zooms. So you can configure them differently. Symbols and boat shapes. So if you want to display the shape, check the box and pick an SHP file, use our boat shape editor. Um, Ectus marker is that little circle with wings that has an arrow off the front of it. That's the needle I talk about when you're in your start automatic start line gate. You're going to pop the balloon and start logging. 
Um, circle, obviously, is a circle with a crosshair, and then you have a fish and a square. <coughs> I remember like when I, s when I set uh, the color of the boat, perimeter color, field color, uh, some of the information, some of the numbers, like in the... Data display. The data, data display, just... Uh, they change. They change, like, they take the color of that field color or perimeter color. I remember, remember like color. once, like, uh, uh, we changed to white, like, field color was white or something like that was white, and we, we lost all this, like, information, like, what is going on? So what happened was... Yeah. In the data display, it takes your, I believe it's your perimeter color now, mm -hmm. and that's what gets the color for the text in your data display. Why? Because people that have multiple mobiles want to know the X, Y of the multiple mobiles. It actually came about because of a Navy project where they had multiple mobiles that they were tracking, and to quickly identify boat two versus boat one in the data display, mm -hmm. they changed the perimeter color to red and yellow. And then on the data display, you have red numbers and yellow numbers, and you can look and say yellow is the boat I care about. They were dropping bombs on a barge and had to know where different things were, so it was important to them to quickly identify where stuff was. But that's what happened. Part of our deowling, we're going to give you the ability to set the color so that it will always be black or always be one color, so that you don't have that perimeter color changing the color. I also have one more question. Uh, can you go like back to like a couple? Yes, it's right here. Uh, do you see that extend GMC to edge of window? Yes. Uh, is it possible to change that uh, vector from the uh, white, like it's like a, it's not white, it's like very light gray. Uh, yes. To the like dark color. So, what do you, does everyone see? What he's talking about? Extend CMG to edge of window. You know what CMG is? Course made good. So as you're trucking along, anyone ever crab in a boat? You know what I'm talking about? I want to go that way, but the current's really strong, so I got to steer that way to go that way, right? So, if you could bring high pack up on the screen for me, real quick. Actually, forget it. We'll just talk about it. <coughs> you know, during the sunny day, like it's really hard to like to see that uh, light gray. So, scheme builder. Have you ever been in scheme builder? Bring high pack up. We'll step out of the powerpoints for a minute because we don't like death by power. They don't like death by PowerPoint. You guys all like PowerPoints, right? Mm -hmm. I love looking at them. Trust me, I love spending weeks looking at them. <laughs> <laughs> now he's done something good. Why is it in PowerPoint? I don't know. Bring PowerPoint back up. Rob's going to have to edit this out. <laughs> you guys met Rob, right? I yeah. talked about Rob. Go back to the time. Slideshow. Current slide. Now you're going to move them all. Oh. All right. Well, we're not going to step out of high pack for a second. Course uh, scheme builder. So there's a program within high pack, and if you go into the help, I can or call or send us an email or go right into the help, it'll tell you how to do it. You can control how everything in survey looks, <coughs> what the course made good defector looks like, how thick the plan, how, anyone ever been on the water? I'm getting older, and you start looking at those plan lines on a boat, and you try to drive, and they're paper thin, you can't hardly see that little red line with the arrows on it. You can make it three times, like the, the what is it called? The width of it, three. And then the lines are nice and fat, and I can actually see them in the daylight from five feet away. So you can change the colors, you can change the um, what the line looks like, you can change the course made good vector. You can set it up for whatever color. So in the bright sunlight, it's hard to see a lot of the time. Steam Builder is a pretty powerful tool. It's cumbersome to use if you don't get into it and really understand what you're changing. Where's it at in the shell? In the shell, if you go under settings, Scheme Builder. And then you, there's four predefined schemes. There's a default, there might be five. Default, light day, dark day, light night, dark night. And if you're in survey, I think we're going to talk about it in a minute and show you where it's at. But I'll make sure you guys see where it's at. All right, let's carry on. So you can make really complicated shapes like this in the, sh the shape editor. But you can also do them in DXF. 
we have the ability to bring in DXF shapes, which isn't such a big deal. You guys are on survey boats and you're, you're not really care about where the cleat is, but when you're on a dredge or something else, some of those shapes, I mean, they're, you know, some of the shapes we've put together for some of the dredges get really complicated. I spent a lot of time digitizing a dredge once because I was bored. I had to sit on board overnight. And I was putting anchor chains and stuff on it. Uh, okay, vessel track. If you check the vessel track, however many seconds it's going to draw a breadcrumb trail behind you so you see where you were. If you're not using plant lines, vessel track's really nice so you can try to offset and not cover the same area. Uh, of course, make good vector draws a little circle out in front, and the number of seconds is the end of the circle. So if you have a course made good vector, not the one that says go to the end of the screen, but just a course made good vector, you put in the number of seconds. And it varies with your speed. So if you check that box, it tells you in X number of seconds that's where you're going to get a turn. If you've got a guy that can't see the screen and you're watching the screen and he's driving the boat, all right, we got about another 30 seconds left. Course made good vectors at the edge. It's a really nice way to kind of figure that out. Uh, rain circles and offsets. Um, dredgers, uh, we do a lot of turbidity monitoring. So on the dredge, we'll put a range circle around the dredge. And then if we're transmitting our position to the dredge, as long as we're inside that circle, we can take our turbidity reading. I did that on one project. Or I don't want to be within 50 feet of whatever. I can put a 50 foot circle around my boat. And it gives me a circle that moves with my boat that is just a perimeter, like a safety buffer. Maybe if I was surveying with Jose out there, I'd put a buffer on it because I don't know if he can drive a straight line, so I'd have to make sure I'd have a buffer on it. Nobody laughed with Jose. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, where are we at? Draft. draft. Anyone ever, this is going to get kind of confusing for a second. Draft. Does anyone ever enter draft in their boat? Why would you change the draft of your boat? Do you know? Okay, you wouldn't. You're in single beam class. We're talking about single beams, right? Anyone bar check a single beam? What is a bar check of a single beam calibrated to? What is your zero reference of a bar check? The water surface. Because when you put that bar in the water, your chain stops at the water surface, right? So when you put the chain in the water, you put it five feet underwater. How many people have an odom? Your physical offset of your odom in the odom software, why I keep picking on odom, I'm sorry, they have an offset and they have a draft. The physical measurement from the water to the face of the transducer is their draft. But that's always a little bit off from what you're reading. So when you do a bar check, you adjust offset, not draft. You set the physical draft. In high pack, you can also change draft. If you change draft in high pack, I'm telling you this because you're single beam surveyors, if you change draft in high pack, you better know why you did it. Because when you bar checked your sonar, it was depth below water. Your sonar is giving you depth below water. Make sense? If you added fuel to the boat, I always used to joke, anyone remember Lourdes? Don't ever meet Lourdes? Anyone have a 10 year old sister? It's about how big Lourdes was. I got a 10 year old daughter. I'm not trying to pick on Lourdes, I apologize. I'm gonna have to have a problem with that. <laughs> Here's a little lady. If I got in the boat, I'm not a little guy. If Lourdes did the bar check and then I get in the boat, the draft changed several inches. Right? If the draft changes several inches and she bar checked it, my depths are wrong. Everyone understand what I'm saying? I could have Lourdes bar checked the boat. I have to use somebody else's name. My daughter Madeline bar checked the boat, marked the water line. And then I get in, and whatever water came up, I could adjust in this draft setting. Change in draft after the bar check. You could do that. Don't change your draft. Rob, delete this section. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Ghost shapes. I just did this on a project. Ghost shapes are really nice for barge movements and rig movements. If you're going to move a job on site, or if you're moving a dredge into a new position to start a cut, you can say, I want you to start the cut and give it an X and a Y and a heading. And it will take your boat shape and it will position that little purple see-through shape over there. I want you to take this barge and line up with that. So the dredge operator or the, the tug operator can actually drive over and just fit it to the template. And as soon as he's there, we're good. It's 
a really cool way to move barges around or dredges. Dead reckoning calculates the position based on the current speed. Anyone understand what dead reckoning is? Anyone ever work in the military on ships? Been on a ship? Dead reckoning. When you lose GPS fix and you say, I'm going 10 knots and I was going north, where am I in 10 minutes? That's what dead reckoning is. When you lose GPS fix going under a bridge, <coughs> unfortunately, dead reckoning is designed to fix that, but it has a hard time if you lose position because a lot of GPSs still put out the bad position. So you lose your GPS fix right here when you get to the end of the bridge and it's putting out that position that was back there. So your GPS still thinks it's giving you a position. So the software has to detect that the position hasn't changed before dead reckoning can in. So it can be a little messed up. But dead reckoning is good for that. Position rejects. So this number determines how fast dead reckoning kicks in. How far and how fast. Got next. Heave drift alarm. If drift is going up, right, 30 seconds exceed zero, so it averages your heave. And if your heave over 30 seconds exceeds zero, it's going to say, yeah, we're, <coughs> we have a problem, it's going to give you an alert. Targets. I'll let you talk about targets. Okay. Sure. So, <clears throat> target is a position of interest. Um, in addition to target uh, position, target may have various associated attributes um, and metadata, including depth, uh, name, offset, uh, size scan targeting information. Uh, targets can be created in many ways. Uh, you can double click in the area of the map where you want to mark a target. Uh, you can press F5 with the shortcut key um, in the target editor tool or in any other device specific display windows. So, you know, simple explanation of target is just putting an X somewhere and obviously you have some some interest there so there's uh, many display options <coughs> the shell for the target you can put different symbols um, for the targets so the default target parameters window determines how new targets will be displayed by default. Uh, after a target is marked, the default display options can be changed uh, for each target individually. So you can go and pull up a list of the targets that you marked. So editing a target and survey. The details of an active target can be modified and uh, target properties dialog box. Um, all options are stored in the target database for the active project and will be retained in the IPAC shell. Target's position can be adjusted by giving it a distance and a bearing. Um, in this case, the main position represents the vessel and the target's position is measured, measured uh, relative to it. HiPAC can generate such targets automatically with uh, certain laser range finders. A distance and bearing target's position can be readjusted in the target editor. So you can go and just double click, create a target, and then you can go and pull that up and you can edit the, the uh, you know, that long of a target. Um, if you want to mark something specifically, you can, you can edit the target's location, the name, and everything. So target information in the data display. So earlier we talked about configuring the data display window. Um, you can put information from targets in that data display. Um, so statistics relative to primary and global can be displayed including distance and bearing, <laughs> offset distance, and absolute coordinates uh, relative to a vessel, um, time to intercept uh, at current speed. So this is for targets that you have and maybe approaching them. Um, necessary, necessary speed to intercept uh, given the time specified in the target name. So I'm going to stop you real quick. Yep. A little while ago I talked about the Navy project with bombs. That's what this is for. We 
program this in because they were dropping test bombs and they were towing a barge and they had to have the barge on top of the target at a certain time. So we had to program into the software to detect. Once you have a target X, Y, and everything, you know the distance, you know the bearing. Target time is when you're going to hit the target, right? The target speed, targets don't move. But you had to know how fast and where's the intercept. That way you didn't put it in there. Just the uh, offset. Go back. Put them too fast. Target time is the time to intercept at current speed. And then target speed was the speed required to intercept at the time. So if you put a time in the target's name, it said, okay, to hit the target at that time, you need to go this fast on this bearing at this distance, and then you'll be there. It's kind of a cool, fun project we did. How do you increment targets? Um, and you can't increment targets easily. You have to right click and select a target. There's no control I, control D, or anything. Creating planned lines to and from targets. So you can create planned lines uh, using targets as reference points within the right click menu. So right clicking inside the map window. Line to current, create a planned line between two targets. So line to the current target. Um, line to vessel, create a planned line between current vessel position and the target that, that you've clicked on. The created plan line will be appended to the active plan line uh, file and the LNW file. So managing the target in the survey dialog box um, under targets. Pull up the list of targets that you've made you, you can modify them. Um, you can check or uncheck them to hide them. Um, do, create them in there, delete them, delete them in there. Uh, modify their position data. You can make an existing target the current one. Click on it and that'll be the current target that you're using. Water's edge targets are a special kind of target for marking the location of riverbanks. Press S7 prior to going on and off the line. A special depth can be logged with at this, posi at this position in the raw file. You have to point your boat towards the bank. Okay, that's the ones you were talking about putting. You drive towards the bank, stop, hit F7, and say how far away you are from the line. So water's edge targets will be processed as a zero depth sounding at the position of the marked target. It will draw a straight line from the last sounding on the water to the surface. And to, do not use for volumes. So water level corrections. The height <coughs> of the water level relative to the turn data it's called the tide correction or water level correction. Um, in, in depth mode, tide uh, positive if the water level is below the chart datum, negative if the water level is above the chart datum. So, really quick. Yeah. yeah, yeah to that. Positive and negative tides. Sorry, I keep just hitting down to it. Everyone understand how to enter tides in high pack? Anyone in here use tides? Water level corrections, you know what they are. How do, how do you enter them in high pack? Negative. Always a negative above gauge. Always a negative above gauge. You never <coughs> enter your tides as a positive number above gauge. So if this is zero, this is a negative. Does anyone understand why? It's the complete opposite of how you read a tide gauge, right? So if you read a tide gauge and it's two feet above gauge, it's two feet of tide. Make sense? Two, we have two feet of tide. In high pack, it's a negative two feet. I've been told for 22 years that the reason is when they first did this, negative numbers are easier to add in old computers. When they were using rinky-dink old-ass computers, 
it was a positive, it was always adding numbers together. There was no subtraction. Doesn't make sense to me. I don't think it's real, but that's the joke that I was on. I think it's one of those things they told me to see if I'd continue to say it and be stupid. <laughs> but I'm still saying it 22 years later. We take your water depth from your boat to the bottom, it's 10 feet. We take your water above tide, if we add two feet, you end up with 12 feet of water. But you really should subtract that two feet out of the 10 and have eight feet of charted water. That makes sense? We always, want to, we always want to remove water above gauge to get back to gauge. That's our charted zero point that we want to start your reading from. So if I'm in a boat in 10 feet of water and I've got two feet of tide, I want to subtract that two feet of tide. It's very confusing to a lot of people because in elevation mode, positive is up and negative is down, you still enter your tide as a negative number. You always enter your tide as a negative number. Always enter your tide as what? A negative number. I'm saying that because you're going to call me in about a month and you're going to say, I entered my tide as a positive number because you said negative too much. <laughs> going to happen, right? Someone's going to, somebody's going to call up and I screwed up my tide. In processing, you can always invert your tides. There's a bunch of things to fix it, so it's okay. But always enter your tides as a negative number. Okay? How do you enter your tides? Negative number. <laughs> Passed his test. All right, so real time water level correction methods. Uh, manually enter it in. Uh, survey, the most basic option, um, simply enter the tide value in survey at the start of each line and on any change, um, suitable for local areas. Uh, predicted tide file, um, survey logs, uh, the tide record uh, read from a predictive tide model, um, uses a device driver, the tide file to that DLL, uh, to query the predicted model. Automated tide gauge, survey logs, a tide record every time the gauge updates. Requires a tide telemetry driver to communicate with the gauge. And RTK tides, real time kinematic, uh, for RTK GPS um, receivers, can measure the horizontal position and height above the reference of the facility from which you can determine water level corrections. How many people use RTK? There's a whole, whole, it's a whole presentation on, on that. So manually setting tide and survey uh, under the, the tide drop down and survey. You enter this tide's uh, not negative. <laughs> can't have a positive. What's that? You can't have a yeah, positive. Yeah. So you you would enter the tide in there. Not a 59 foot tide. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm thinking yeah. that was a joke. So, you manually enter, enter the <laughs> tide tab drop down, set, and then a simple window comes up, enter a new tide, click OK. Um, a tide record will be logged with the raw, raw file only when the uh, setting is changed. And so, shortcuts to do it uh, be Alt Y or Alt Z to decrease or add one test to the tide. So using a tide gate, does anybody use tide gators? So a survey can read tide data from automated gauge or a predicted tide, uh, tide file by adding the device driver to your hardware configuration. So this requires in the hardware setup to add driver for the tide gauge. Um, the driver display window will show the graph of the tide as it's acquired. And the operator can switch between a gauge, prediction model, or manually entering um, during data collection. It's a tide DR here. Oh, okay. So, RTK tides, um, they're, they can be calculated in different ways. This is this is showing the different, um, you know, your geo reference, your 
water line, static uh, vessel uh, reference, the ellipsoid reference, and, and the bottom. Uh, so it's supported by um, all advanced positioning drivers and high pack. The tide solution is valid when GPS status is RTK fixed or better. Um, can be configured to use a, a KTD kinematic uh, tidal datum uh, file as a reference. And again, there's a dedicated RTK tides presentation. They have a lot more information out there. Okay, so anybody familiar with the uh, HiPack Matrix MTX file? So it's a, it's a gridded rectangular area for recording depth information and, and other data during acquisition. So as Jerry mentioned earlier, it's just making a grid like the tiles on the ceiling. You can change the grid size to whatever you prefer. Obviously a smaller size would give you higher resolution. The matrix is used to track coverage. Calculate cell statistics for multi-beam uh, bathymetry and display real-time surface as data is logged. So matrix configure options. Uh, User-defined matrix files will work with all high pack products, uh, but their bounds need to be predefined. High pack survey can auto-generate a set of matrices. Well, for multi it's a, yeah, for yeah, exactly for multi-beam and, and lidar. You cannot change a method bid survey. One of the things matrixes are nice for, if you guys ever dredge or survey for a shoal, you're looking for a shallow point, you can set your colors up so your squares, and in single beam you wouldn't want, like these are small squares for single beam in a large area, right? You might do a 10 foot by 10 foot square with single beam and have it show you the minimum depth. That way, as you survey across, you're going to get these big blocks that are going to tell you the shallowest point in that block. And if you set red to something you're going to run aground, like I did, then you're not going to run aground because you're going to see, hey, I've got, a sh I've got yellow or orange. It gives you a color idea. And if you miss the number in the corner what the sonar says the depth is, on the screen it's going to be, okay, I've gone from green to yellow. I use stoplight colors, red, yellow, green, blue. Blue is the, it's safe to go there with anything. Green is it's safe, yellow is you've got a caution, and red is, oh crap, we made a mistake. So that's really nice in the matrix. All of a sudden I start to see yellow, I start to pay more attention to what's going on. Make sense? Yeah. All right, so selecting the active device. This is uh, the active device that would update the matrix. So come on back to hardware. Yeah, exactly. Back. This is back into your hardware window. So, in, in hardware, you have to define which device will be used for updating the matrix if, if you're going to use a matrix. Uh, so, typically, if it's going to be either your echo sounder, obviously for single beam or dredging, it would be the the cutter head on a cutter suction um, or whatever digging tool, um, high sweep. Depth data is passed to high pack survey automatically. So your depth device generally will be what's gonna be updating you what you're gonna to want to be updating your matrix with to show your coverage. Um, so high pack programs that can use the matrix files, um, matrix editor, create blank matrix files, mapper can fill matrix files with depths. TIN model can fill matrix files with depths. IPEX survey can update matrix files with depths. And same with high sweep and dredge pack. And XYZ to matrix automatically creates a filled matrix file from an XYZ file. <laughs> Configuring matrix options in IPEX survey. So there's a matrix tab. You can change how the matrix updates. You can record minimum, maximum, average. You can adjust the cell size. <coughs> matrix.
Matrix Window Options to show what it's you know, to sh show is what you want to display. You want to display the survey depth, the dredge depth. Um, each map window can display the matrix information differently according to the appearance uh, settings dialog. So cell depth, uh, cell hit count, transparency, Z scaling, sun illumination. Those are all different appearance settings. So matrix files are created with the matrix editor and the high pack shell. So does anybody know where the matrix editor is in the shell? There's there's a drop down list that'll have I believe it's under preparation. I'll have all the editor tools, and matrix editor would be in there. So in the shell, preparation matrix editor, and you can go in and you can pick uh, corners and the width. I'll be typing all the sizes you want for the, for the editor and for, for the matrix and create it. Just basically creating a, a big grid around, generally around your survey area. Uh, when using user to find matrix files, high pack survey and, and dredge pack will load and unload each one depending on the proximity of the matrix file to the survey vessel. So if you have multiple loaded in there and you're out surveying, you know, use the one that's nearest to you. Um, in automatic matrix mode, survey displays a 3x3 three three matrix grid around the current vessel position. Um, when online, uh, users can display all matrix files when offline. 